Good morning. How's everyone doing? Okay. One person is great. The rest of you are just kind of remains to be seen. Ray Corlew, he's good. All right. Um, before we get into the message this morning, let me just talk about a few brief things, if I could. Uh, in, uh, on May 22nd, Wednesday, May 22nd, we are going to have speaking from this platform at 7 o'clock p.m., Randy Reed. Randy Reed is the leader of, uh, the owner of Reed Automotive, several dealerships here in the Kansas City area, as well as St. Joe's. And uh, Randy is a, is a great, great Christian. He's, he's a leader in his church. And I asked Pastor Dwayne, who has kind of a long-term friendship and relationship with Randy Reed, I said, Pastor Dwayne, try to get Randy to come speak to us because I want our people to learn about kingdom ethics in the marketplace. You know, there's a term that we use often, it's just business, right? It's just business. Giving off the idea that, you know, there, there's a separation between morality and business or ethics and business or relationships and business. But how many of you know that as Christians, we are responsible from God to, to live out our Christ Christianity in the marketplace. And so Randy Reed is, is a great example of how to do that. And uh, Randy has a small group of business owners in the Kansas City area that, that meet together every week. And so if you're a, a business owner, and I know we have several of them in our church, or if you're a businessman or a businesswoman, uh, I want to invite you to Wednesday night, um, May 22nd, 7 p.m., in this auditorium. Uh, and, and I want to say, because sometimes, you know, business people are very, very busy and don't have a lot of extra time, but I just want to encourage you, make some extra time for this. Even those of you who don't normally come out on a Wednesday night, it's a rare, rare, rare opportunity. You won't want to miss it, and you will enjoy it, I am sure. So... Come on out and listen to Randy as he speaks on ethics and business, and I think you'll just be blessed. Also, I want to ask you if you would pray for me this week on Thursday. I fly to Athens, Greece, and from there we'll be doing um, a missions trip. Going to be touring some of our, our missions work in Greece and in uh, Samos, on the island of Samos, and, and in Turkey. While I'm there, I hope to visit, uh, the, 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 the goal is to visit all of the places, the cities where the seven churches of Revelation were. And uh, I want to come back and do a series sometime after I get back. And so, um, I, would you pray with me for traveling mercies and for safety? Going to be going into the country of Turkey, which is kind of a little bit at odds with Israel right now. But... Uh, I'm told from Jameson Creel that it is safe, so I'm going to take his word for it. <laughs> but pray that my energy and my health will remain strong, that I'll come back ready to go. Would you do that for me? I would appreciate it. If you have your Bibles, and you should, turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. In just a moment, we're going to read this text one last time. Uh, in this series. A couple of weeks ago, we experienced a particular uh, solar eclipse, uh, solar eclipse in Kansas City. Um, it was a phenomenon that caused a bunch of speculation, anticipation, and hysterical agitation. Had several people in the church, I don't know, tongue in cheek, call me and say, Pastor Barry, is the world going to end during the solar eclipse? And I'm like, well, other places in the world aren't even going to experience anything at all, so I'm sure we'll be fine. Let's all calm down. <laughs> I, in fact, saw a sign in a store that said, the end is near. Get your solar eclipse glasses here. So there were a lot of businesses trying to take advantage of the hysterica, his, hysteria uh, surrounding the solar eclipse. I, I had coffee with Frank Armado the day of the eclipse at a local coffee shop, and as we were walking into the place, the outdoor seating area around this coffee shop had many people sitting in lawn chairs, gazing at the heavens with their solar glasses, solar eclipse glasses on. It was like they were watching a 3D movie in a movie theater. 
And when it was over, um, one of the employees of the coffee shop came inside the coffee shop, was very, very disappointed, very disheartened, in a bad tone in his voice. And he said out loud, and I heard him say it, nothing happened. <laughs> it was not worth the hype. We're still here, so I have to go back to work. I don't know if he figured he'd be raptured in that moment or swept away by an alien spaceship or something. Who knows? But let me just say something. Although this solar eclipse failed to live up to the hype or the anticipation of cataclysmic events, I will say someday, right? Someday it will be different. In several places, in both the Old and the New Testament, the Bible predicts that there is coming to earth cataclysmic and apocalyptic signs in the heavens that point to the end times and the terrible day of the Lord's wrath at his second coming. Scripture teaches in both the Old and New Testament that this will happen. This current solar eclipse failed to live up to the hype, but someday, someday it's going to happen. And so let me give you some, some of these scripture. I'm just going to put the references on the screen. You might want to write those down or take a picture of that screen. Isaiah 13, 13, Jeremiah 10, 2, Joel 2, 31, Haggai 2, 6, Matthew 24, 29 and 30, Luke 21, 25 and 26, Revelation 6, verses 12 through 17. These are very, very interesting scriptures. It would behoove you to kind of uh, study those on your own. These are the predictions that the Bible makes that someday, someday there is going to be some pretty horrific signs in the heavens that signal the return of the Lord. And so uh, you want to study those later. Those will really amaze you. Let me just read one of these passages. Luke chapter 21, verse 25 and 26. Not our text today, so I won't have you stand, but this is just one of them. It's significant because it's Jesus himself. This is not some crazy Old Testament wild, you know, prophet who lives in a cave somewhere and, uh, you know, and dresses in um, camel's hair and eats locusts. This is Jesus himself, and in Luke chapter 21, verses 25 and 26, he prophesies this. Listen to what he says. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Wow, wow. Let me just say, that day is coming, and I believe it's coming soon, and to survive it, we will need more than just solar eclipse glasses. We're going to need a little bit more than that. Today, I conclude the series, Death Valley. In the series, we've been studying a passage that speaks about some other things that will happen on the earth before the end of days. Some other things that will happen on the earth before the end of days. Would you stand with me and let's read our scripture text today, Ezekiel 37, verse 1 through 14. Let's pay particular attention to those things that, that Ezekiel predicts will happen right near the end. Verse 1, Ezekiel speaking here, he said, The hand of the Lord was on me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones, and he led me back and forth among them, and, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. And then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones. And say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and, will, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. And then you will know that I am the Lord." So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I 
was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, breathe from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they might live. We're going to focus on that this morning. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. And then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They Say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off and therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back into the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. Then I, uh, when I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. This is God's word. Can you say amen to it? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. Speak to us out of it today. Inspire us, motivate us, and we will obey. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The title of my message this morning, Prophesy to These Bones, or excuse me, Prophesy to the Breath. Prophesy to the Breath. Now this text we've just read for the third time in the last couple of weeks speaks in three contexts. It speaks about relevance in the past to the present and in the future, there's three contexts to this passage from Ezekiel 37. Last week, uh, the first week, week one, we examined the historical context, and I'm not going to review that. You can go back and listen to the messages from past weeks. But I talked to you about the historical context. It was written at a specific time to a specific people by a specific pro prophet. Today, or last week, uh, we looked at the contemporary context. How do we apply this to us today? And then this morning, I want to conclude this series by focusing on a third context of this passage, what I'm calling the eschatological or last days context. That's what the word eschatological means. It means the last days. So I want to talk to you today about the eschatological context of this particular passage. And uh, by, by doing that, by way of introduction, I, I just want to touch on four, in the, in the eschatological context, four prophecies of future events from Israel. This scripture, Ezekiel 37, prophesies that four things will happen in the future to Israel. First of all, the resurrection of God's people, Israel, from spiritual death. Spiritual death. Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 12 prophesies this. Therefore, God says uh, to Ezekiel, prophesy and say to them, this is what the Spirit of the Lord says. My people, I'm going to open up your graves and bring you up from them. There's going to be a resurrection from spiritual death to God's people Israel. Remember later on the context uh, God says to Ezekiel, these bones are Israel. Okay, no guessing about it. These bones are Israel. There's going to be a resurrection of God's people, Israel, from spiritual death. Secondly, Ezekiel prophesies a future event for Israel, the return of God's people to their ancestral homeland. A return of God's people to their ancestral homeland. Ezekiel uh, chapter 37, verse 12, Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will bring you back to the land of Israel. I will bring you back to your own land. That's what's going to happen. We have seen this begin to take place in 1948, and in case you're wondering, it, is, it continues to go on today. Millions of ethnic, ethnic Jewish people from around the world called the diaspora, the scattered Jewish people who were scattered to the four quarters of the earth 
are returning, have begun to return in 1948 and are returning even today back to the land of Israel. There are thousands of people a week that come into the land. They, what, they make what's called Aliyah. They return to the land um, of Israel even as the Lord prophesied this would be. Lately, the uh, Jewish people from the Ukraine, the Jewish people from, from, uh, fr- from the Soviet Union are returning. Uh, uh, several years ago, it was ethnic Jewish people from Ethiopia in Africa came back to the land. There are about a million Ethiopian Jews, ethnic Jewish people living in the land. God called them back into the land. It was prophesied by Ezekiel and is happening today and going to continue to happen in the future. Third, the, the prophesied, the, remnant, the remembrance of God's people of his covenantal sovereignty. The remembrance of God's people of his covenantal sovereignty. Now let me just tell you something, friends. Israel is a secular nation. Now, Jewish people, they're God's chosen people. They're, they're, they're God's people, his covenantal people. But you have to understand that there, there is... Um, Israel as a nation is a secular nation. It's not a theocracy. It's, it, it, it's a democracy of some sort. And so it is a, a it, there is not a religious nation, but there's going to have to be a return of God's people uh, to, uh, to recognize and remember his covenantal sovereignty. Verse 13, when my people... Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. You're going to know. You're going to remember me as your God. You're going you're to remember me, and you're going to return to me. And finally, the fourth prophecy of future events for Israel, given in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, is the revival of God's people spiritually. Isn't it interesting that God puts four prophecies in there, and they all begin with the, with the letter R? It's just amazing to me. It's a joke, by the way. Um, the revival of God's people spiritually. Ezekiel 37, 14, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. See, God is prophesying through Ezekiel that there's going to be a spiritual revival take place in Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I'm the Lord and I will, I will settle you in your land and I will put my spirit in you. I'll put my spirit in you, declares the Lord. So these prophecies that we find in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, speak of the end. What's going to happen in Israel, future events, just before the second coming of Christ. This is an eschatological um, context. Now I want to give you a New Testament parallel passage, and it's found in Romans chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. Paul says this. I want you to see there's a New Testament kind of version of this. Look what Paul says, and who is he speaking to? The book of Romans is written to Gentiles. It's written to churches in Rome. Now, there were some Jews in the churches, but mostly it was written to, to, to Gentiles. Uh, and so look what Paul says. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Okay? Paul, the Apostle Paul, in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 11, is prophesying a revival that will take place in Israel. I find this very interesting. Look at this. This is so interesting. Don't be conceited. He's talking to, he's talking to Gentiles here. <laughs> Don't be conceited. Uh, you know, uh, don't start feeling superior. God has not abandoned his people. They are experiencing a hardening right now. Why? So that there can be an influx of Gentiles to come in. And then he prophesies the future spiritual revival. In this way, all of Israel will be saved. All of Israel living on the earth at the time that this revival takes place will be saved. Now, I have a question for you to contemplate for just a moment. Look at that phrase, until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. See that? I have it underlined in the text. Until the full measure of the number of the Gentiles has come in. So let me ask a question. 
Come in where? Come in where? Simply put, here's, here's the best answer I can give. Into the covenantal family of Israel. Now is a time in the eschatological timeline of God's plan for the earth. Now is the age of the church. Now is the age of Gentiles. Now is the time when Gentiles come in. Come into what? Come into the covenantal family of Israel. There should be no anti-Semitism in the church of Jesus Christ today. The church does not replace Israel. We join the covenantal family. We come in. Come into what? Come into the covenantal family of Israel. We're a part of that family. And until the last number of Gentiles has come in, then God will pour out his spirit. He'll, he'll send a revival to Israel, and in Israel we will be saved, and the second coming will take place, okay? So, here's the big idea. And again, when we're talking about covenantal, the covenantal family of Israel, we're not talking about the ethnic family of Israel. There's ethnic family, those with the DNA of uh, Jewish DNA. They're ethnic Jews, okay? We're talking about covenantal Jewish people. We're a part of the covenant of Abraham. The Bible says the heir of Abraham, singular, who's the heir of the covenant of Abraham? Jesus. And through Jesus, we come into the covenantal family of Israel. So, uh, I hope you understand that. Here's the big idea for this Uh, of this text that builds on the last two weeks. Here's the big idea. In the death valley of your life, God not only wants you to believe and trust in him for new life, he wants to partner with you to bring it to pass. Those were last week's big ideas. Here's this week. So pray fervently that God will breathe his spirit into you again. Pray fervently that God will breathe his spirit into you again. Let me give you some important lessons in the text and in some New Testament parallel passages, okay? Some, some important lessons. I'm going to give you five uh, from this text and some parallel passages. Ready to go? Hang with me. We're going to go. We're going to cruise through this rather fast. I want you to get this. It's really important. The first lesson is this. Throughout the Old Testament, breath, wind, and spirit are synonymous, Throughout the Old Testament, breath, wind, and spirit are synonymous. Breath, wind, and spirit. They're not only synonymous, they are in fact identical words used in the original language. Now let me just say, the original language Hebrew or Aramaic is a language that does not have as big a vocabulary as the Greek language. The same word is used in the original language translated into English, breath, wind, and spirit. And in this text, our text that we read today from Ezekiel 37, the same Hebrew word is used for each of this word in English. The same Hebrew word. So let me give you a quick Hebrew lesson. You say, oh, Pastor Barry, Hebrew lesson, we're going to be bored. Try not to be bored. This is important. I'll give you a quick Hebrew lesson, okay? The Hebrew word in this text for wind, spirit, and breath is the word ruach. It's kind of a unique spelling up there. There's like a H with a little dot under it. I don't know what that is. But that's, that's kind of a transliteration of the word in the Hebrew, and it's pronounced ruach. If you ever, if you ever go to Israel and hear them speak Hebrew, they really use that There's a lot of and it's, it's, all, it's a lot of the languages that ruach, you know, that ach, which makes for interesting songs when they sing, because they still sing it, you know, oh God, and it's interesting kind of a sounding kind of a thing. So that's the Hebrew word that is translated into English, breath, wind, or spirit. So Here's what I want to do quickly. Hang with me. Let me read the scripture again with these words inserted exactly as they appear in the original language. Thank God for Bible software. Here we go. Our text, Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 9 and verse 14. Let me read it to you, inserting these words that are actually in the original language. Then he said to me, prophesy to the ruach. Translated in English, breath. Prophesy to the Ruach. 
prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, ruach, spirit, from the four ruach winds, (laughs) and breathe into these slain that they may live. Same word translated into three different English words. Isn't that interesting? Breath, wind, spirit. Verse 14, I will put my ruach in you and you will live. My breath in you and you will live. So, and here's the point. Here's the point of this lesson. Write this down. Don't miss this. When God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to breath, he is saying prophesy to the Spirit. Now, if we have any cessationists in the house or watching via our online campus, you're going to object to this. Because you're going to say, that's, that's, that's crazy. You know? What is a cessationist? A cessationist is a Christian who believes that the gifts of the Spirit mentioned in the New Testament are not for today. They ceased Hence the word cessation. They ceased with the death of the apostles. So we have no more prophecy. We, we really have no more gift of healing. We have no more gifts of faith. We, we have these, these ceased with the apostles. By the way, you're in a church or watching a church or attending a church today that is not a cessationist. We, we are continuationists. We believe the gifts of the Spirit are meant to continue today. Now, Having said that, let me say that often we continuationists abuse the gifts. We get them wrong. We practice them wrong. And that's that's often what happens. So let me just say this. Prophesying is not commanding or manipulating. Hear me out. When God said to Ezekiel, and when God says prophesy in the New Testament, he's not saying command, and he's not saying manipulate. And often that's what those who continue to use the gifts today, what they do, they manipulate people by use of the gifts, by misuse, I should say, of the gifts of the Spirit. So understand this, prophesying is not commanding. We can't command God. Understand that. We can't command God. And anyone that tells you you can, they're misusing this. There's a little, in charismatic circles, there's this little false teaching called the little God's theory where that says we're little gods so we can command. We can't command. That's not what prophecy is. If you were here last week, you heard me give you a definition of prophecy. It bears repeating today. Last week I said this. If you were not here, write this down. Here's what prophecy is in a New Testament context. Prophecy is the spiritual gift of speaking God's will or God's word under the direct impulse of the Holy Spirit into a present situation. Not commanding, not manipulating, but knowing God's will and God's word that pertains to a certain situation and speaking it has very little to do with foretelling, okay? You're with me. So understand, God tells Elijah to prophesy to the breath. He is saying prophesy to the spirit. Speak God's will or God's will uh, word to the spirit, And the Bible says when he did it, then God moved. This is the partnership that we have with God, right? We we pray and he performs, right? (laughs) We obey him and he brings it to pass. It's awful quiet out here. And and that's okay. Uh, It's okay, but it is kind of quiet I hope that your, your quietness doesn't mean that you're either sleeping or disagreeing. Because sometimes quiet, I just, I just don't know if I believe that. So, so hang with me this morning, all right? So here we go. The first lesson in this particular passage is that throughout the Old Testament, breath, wind, and spirit are synonymous. Now I want you to see something that's really cool. Lesson number two, this is really cool. Breath, wind, and spirit are the same in the New Testament as well. It's really cool. Let me show you this. In the New Testament, the word that means breath, wind, or spirit is one word, and it is pneuma. P-N-E-U-M-A, pneuma, from which we get the word 
pneumatology, which is the study of the Holy Spirit. Pneuma, that's spirit, that's wind, or that's breath. All of these are translated in the English this way. Let me show you. John chapter 3, verse 8. New Testament here, look at this. Here it is in the original language. The wind, pneuma, that's the word in the original language, blows wherever it pleases. You hear the sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Pneuma, capital P. <laughs> All right? Then you zip down to Revelation chapter 11, verse 10 and 11. I love this. There are two witnesses in the book of Revelation witnesses that during the great tribulation they witness to people they 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 evangelize they're the two great witnesses of revelation you can find this story in revelation chapter 11 look what it says here this is interesting the inhabits finally they kill these two witnesses they kill these two witnesses and look what the scripture says the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other's gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But, look at this, after the three and a half days, the breath, or the pneuma, the pneuma of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Now let me just tell you something. This passage sounds very familiar to Ezekiel 37, doesn't it? The breath goes into them and they stand up on their feet like a two-man army. The breath of God breathed on them. After three and a half days, the pneuma, the breath of life from God entered into them and they stood up. Now this is good. I love this. Second thing I want to say about this is that the pneuma, breath, wind, or spirit, is what gave birth to the church. The pneuma, the breath, wind, or spirit, is what gave birth to the church. Let's read it. Again, I'm going to insert the word there where it is in the original language. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed like tongues of fire that had separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, the pneuma, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now let me just ask you a question. Do you see how, the, how cool the Bible is? <laughs> I mean, think about it for a second. How cool is the Bible? In both the Old Testament, the word ruach means the same three things. And in the New Testament, the word, a different language, the word is pneuma, and it means the same three things, translated the same way. Now, now isn't that cool? I think that is so cool. The New and the Old Testament in perfect harmony. I think that's cool. Third lesson. Third lesson from this text and other parallel passages. Life and breath are often paired in Scripture. Life and breath. This is very, very important. Listen, I'm about to tell you what separates us from animals. I'm about to tell you the difference between biology and zoe. Okay? About to tell you what makes us distinct from all the other creation. It's life and breath. I want to show you four places in Scripture where life and breath are paired together. First, let's look in our text, Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 6. Look at it. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin, and I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Breath and life. There it is. Breath and life. And then you will know that I am the Lord breath and life. Moses in Genesis says basically the same thing about life and breath. Genesis chapter 6 verse 17, I am going, God is saying here, I am going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Remember God was grieved because there was sin everywhere and he decided he was going to destroy the, destroy the earth with a flood. So I'm going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life. Life and breath, the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. Life and breath, 
They're paired together. Listen, this is really important, really important. Let's look at the third one, Job. Job says the same thing in the book of Job. Job chapter 12, verse 10. In his hand is, talking about God, in his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. The life and the breath. Life and breath. Life and breath often paired together in Scripture. Let's look at a New Testament version of this. Paul on Mars Hill in Athens. Next week, I'll be on Mars Hill. I'll be standing in that very place. I've been there twice before. I'm getting ready to go to a third time. I love reading Acts chapter 17 from the place where Paul spoke it. <laughs> it's so cool. Look at on Mars Hill, he says this, Acts 17, 25. Nor is he served by human hands. Look at this. As though he needed anything, since he himself gives to, to all life and breath. You see it? Life and breath and everything. Life and breath. Paired together. Life and breath. Let me say it this way. So, when we prophesy to the breath, we prophesy what? Life. When we prophesy to the breath, we speak the will and the word of God, and we prophesy life. Now, let me just say this. It is the breath of God that distinguishes us from all other life forms on the earth. The breath of God. It's what separates us from the animals. Now, let me tell you what our culture, look at me, look at me for a minute. Let me tell you how our culture is trying to brainwash us. Look at me. They're saying this. When I say look at me, I don't mean because I'm so good looking. I'm just saying pay attention. This is really important, okay? <laughs> Our culture is trying to tell you that you are nothing but biology. You're nothing but biology. All you are is biology, and you are evolving according to bio Biology. What our culture is trying to tell you is there's no breath of God in you. There's no spark of divine life in you. You're just biology. Biology's going to do what biology wants to do. So therefore, there's no sin. There's just, we're going to do what comes natural, right? But the Bible tells us you are life and breath. It is the breath of God that distinguishes you from all other life forms. Let me tell you something. They're looking for life on Mars. And they're like, we found water. There could be life in that water. But is there the breath of God there? What distinguishes you from all other creation is the breath of God. All right. You are much more than just biology. Lesson number four. Quickly, quickly. Lesson four. This is really important, really important. Here we go. Life is formed before it breathes. Now you're saying, huh? Pastor Claire, what are you talking about? Well, yeah, write it down. And give me a chance to explain it. Then you can ask questions, all right? Life is formed before it breathes. Now I see in Scripture, in multiple places, two phases to the creation of life. In our text, there's two phases to the creation of life. I want you to see it. This is so important. Phase one, life is formed. Phase one, life is formed. In Genesis chapter two, verse seven, look at it. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. Phase one, life is formed. Let's look in our scripture text, Ezekiel chapter 37, verse seven and eight. Look at this, same thing happening here. So, phase one, so I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them. Let me just pause right there and say, that's biological life. Skin, bones, tendons, Flesh, biological life, but, but that's not the rest of it. The rest of it says, but there was no, look at, breath in them. Phase one, life is formed. Now, the implications of this are staggering. Let me give you one, one important implication. 
Here we go. Life is formed in the womb before it breathes. Now, this is going to be a cringe moment if we have anybody in the house that's not pro-life. And I could hear you almost saying, oh, Pastor Barry, you're going to get political on us. Now you're going to get political on us. Let me just tell you something. Abortion is not a political issue. It is not a political issue. It is a moral, biblical issue. I believe with all my heart, all my soul, my strength, the Bible preaches pro-life. Let's look at it. Life is formed in the womb before it breathes. Look at Psalm 139, verses 13 13 through 16 from the English Standard Version, a word-for-word translation. Look at it. For you, psalmist is speaking here. David, the psalmist is speaking here. He's talking to God. He says, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. Look at this, look at this. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me before uh, when, when as yet there was none of them. When you formed me, you plotted my life, the days of my life, before any one of them was ever lived, you plotted them out before I breathed. Now listen to me, there are some denominations of Christianity who believe (laughs) that life does not begin until birth, that life does not begin until it breathes clearly. The scripture teaches, before I breathed, you formed me and laid out the days of my life before any of them came to be. So let me tell you something, friends. Life begins before breath. The Bible's clear. Life is formed in the mother's womb, and every day is formed even before it breathes. Phase one is life. It is formed even before it breathes. Now, let's go to phase two, because this is important. This is important. Phase two, life is filled. See, listen. Listen. In humankind, there's two phases to life. Life is formed and life is filled. Look at, let me me show you at creation and then let me show you in our text. Okay, at creation, Genesis chapter two, verse seven, life is filled. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust, from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living thing. So he formed him and then he breathed in him. Phase two, two phases. Let's look at our text, Ezekiel 37, verse 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered into them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Pastor Barry, I thought you said, I thought you said life came before breath. It did. It's just incomplete life. It's just not full life. It's it's biology. How many of you know we're much more than biology? Right? We're more than biology. We have the breath of God, the divine breath of God that separates us from all of the creation. I'm going to go home and tell my dog, I'm sorry. You're a good dog. I love you. I'll pay you. I feed you. But I've got the breath of God. Separates me. The breath of God. Human life is a valuable. Why? Because it's formed and filled. Now, let me say this before I continue. The life that Jesus gives, New Testament life. I want you to see this because this is, this blows me away how cool the Bible is in bringing across truth. The life that Jesus gives is a life that is formed and filled. Look at 
John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Now let me tell you something. The, the King James Version mistranslates this. It says life abundantly, more abundantly, but literally translated, it's life to the full. In other words, biological life and, isn't that cool? Life and breath, life and full life. Now, what are the implications of this? Hang with me, hang with me. How many of you are with me? You with me? Yeah, you just want me to get done quick. All right, I'll move. When life is aborted, oh gosh, we're back on that, Pastor, come on. When life is aborted, while it is still in the mother's womb, it is denied life to the full. God can and does forgive and restore. If, you've been a part, if you're a man and you've been a part of an abortion, you've, you, you've counseled you know, your spouse or girlfriend, if, if you're a woman, you've committed abortion, God f- forgives and he restores. I'm not condemning There's no condemnation. You can be forgiven. But I have to say the truth nonetheless. Abortion is not a reproductive right. It's not. It's the denying of the breath of life, the life to the full that Jesus gives to a formed life. It's murder. We take the breath away. We stop their ability to have the breath of God. Unapologetically, unapologetically pro life. Let me put one more capstone on this. Let this blow your mind. You say, well, see, Life is incomplete, doesn't have the breath of life in it when it's still in the womb. No, let me just say this, and I'm going to prove it to you scripturally. Life can be filled before it breathes. Life can be filled before it breathes. Let me show you Luke chapter 1, verses 13 through 15 and verse 41. Look at this, look at this. This is the word of the Lord. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and are, you are to call him John, and he will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. What? Filled before he breathed? That's what the word of God says. Verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. God prophesied to Zechariah, John the Baptist will be filled before he breathes. The breath of God, the filling of breath of God before he breathes. Pastor Barry, please move off of this. Okay, we'll move off of this. Number five. Number five. I'm about done. The fifth lesson. This is where we get practical. What do we do? What's our takeaway? The lesson from this that we can take away is this. Be continually filled with the Spirit. Now let me just say this quite candidly and quite directly. This is, God does the filling, we partner with Him. The Scripture tells us be filled with the Holy Spirit. When Jesus breathed on His disciples, the text is going to come up. When Jesus breathed on his disciples, John 20, verse 21, 23, again Jesus said, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, okay, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you, okay, and with that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. See, God, ask God to fill and refill you with his Spirit for his purpose. Ask God. This is your responsibility. Ask God. He said to his disciples, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. 
And it's all in the context of purpose. Now, let me tell you something where we often go wrong. Hear me. We as Pentecostals, I'm preaching against us today. We often go wrong in this, in this way. We believe the baptism in the Holy Spirit is for our personal edification. Oh, I feel so good when the Holy Spirit is moving in me. Uh, the Holy Spirit fills us. God fills us with his Holy Spirit to, to, to have purpose. Jesus said, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit as a part of sending you. Furthermore, if you forgive men their sins, they're going to be forgiven. If you don't, they're not. In other words, go out and proclaim the forgiveness of God. Go out and preach the gospel, which has the power, if received, to forgive sin. The gospel, not you. So, be continually filled with the Spirit. Number one, ask God to fill or refill you with His Spirit for His purpose. God breathed the Spirit on them for a purpose. Dead bones were resurrected as an army. Number two, musicians come, we're going to conclude this. Call out to God for a great evangelistic outpouring of His Spirit. Call out to God for a great evangelistic outpouring of his spirit. Acts chapter 2, verses 4 through 21. I want you to see what happened with Peter on the day of Pentecost. When Peter, then Peter stood up with the eleven, look at this, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews, and all you who live in Jerusalem. Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Look at this. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Wow. I will show wonders in the heavens above. Now, what are you talking? Now, listen, I thought, I thought the gifts ceased with the apostles. No. The Bible says you're going to prophesy right up till the heavens are shaken. Look at this. <laughs> And they will prophesy, and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Has that happened yet? Has the sun turned to darkness? Has the moon turned to blood? Have the heavens been shaken yet? No. So we prophesy. We prophesy to the breath. We don't manipulate. We don't command. We speak the word and the will of God into every situation. We speak to sickness in the name of Jesus according to the will and the power of the atoning work of Christ on Calvary. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be saved from your sin and wickedness. Repent and be saved. We prophesy the will and word of God. Prophesy to the breath. Pour out your spirit. Pour out your spirit, God. Pour it out on us. Number three, pray or prophesy for the spirit of God to fall upon Israel again. Pray or prophesy for the spirit of God to fall on Israel again. I want to show you a scripture from Zechariah chapter 12, verse 16. This is so cool. Look at what God says, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. And they will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one who mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. In other words, they're going to repent for piercing the Messiah. God says, I'm going, <laughs> I'm going to pour out in the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and supplication, and they're going to repent. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, it says the spirit of the bride say, come, come, Lord, come, Lord, come. 
Now let me just say, if you're the bride of Christ, and I certainly am, I believe I am, you are longing for his appearance and you are praying for the Spirit of God to fall upon Israel again as prophesied in Ezekiel and Zechariah. How many of you are with me? How many of you just want me to quit? That's okay, you can say amen. I want me to quit too. I want me to quit. Enough is enough. All right. Let me leave you with one question. Just think about this for a second. I'm almost done. I'm done. And you won't have to put up with me for two weeks. I'll be gone. When was the last time God breathed a fresh wind of his spirit on you? When was the last time? See, in the valley, the death valley of your life, perhaps it's time for a fresh breath of God, the pneuma of God, to bring life out of death. Maybe your relationship with God needs to be fanned into flame. It's smoldering, it's smoking, it's going out. It's, it's time to prophesy to the breath, speak God's word, his will, under the direct impulse of the Holy Spirit into a present situation. It's time you hear the voice of God saying to your valley of dry bones, dead bones, hear the word of the Lord, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Hear the word of the Lord. Come alive. Stand with me. I'm going to have our prayer partners to come. Maybe you need prayer today. I'm done. Let's quit. We're going to pray, and I'm going to ask you if you have, you have need, you need, you have sickness in your body. We're going to prophesy to the breath. <laughs> Holy Spirit of God, send a fresh breath, a fresh wind of God. Perhaps you're here today and you need a fresh, fresh relationship, wind of God. Let's pray. Our glorious and heavenly Father, we come to you today from a dry and barren land. Breathe upon us, O oh God. Let the fresh wind of your Holy Spirit fill us anew with the life of God. We repent of our silence in the face of death. Forgive us for not speaking up for the life of the unborn. Holy Spirit, pour out upon the death valley of the United States of America, a fresh last days revival that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fill us, Holy Spirit, and we will prophesy. We will speak God's word, his will, under the direct impulse of the Holy Spirit into our present situation. Revive us, resurrect us, that every last one of the Gentiles would come into the covenant family of Israel and then Save Israel again, we pray. God, you have returned them to their land. Now raise up the dead bones of your covenant family, Israel. Send your breath. Give the life of Jesus, life to the full, to Israel. Make us an army again before Jesus comes. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Everyone said, amen. God bless you. If you need prayer, come. Let's sing that song again if we could. Spirit, sing.